Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Kimmel Bay Church. Thank you. Great to see you all. I know we've got some visitors this morning, so welcome to morning worship here at KBC. I've got some notices to start with, and the first notice is for the children. Who's excited to go back to school this week? <laughs> all the parents, Steve said. Amen. Amen. Um, if, if you'd like to receive all the emails from church, then you need to opt in. So Elaine's got some forms. If you haven't opted in, you won't get any emails, which is absolutely fine, but you can't complain about communication. Gordon. Thank you. Uh, Matt, do you want to turn me up? As you write, just turn around. Thank you. So communication, if you'd like to receive the emails from Elaine, there's the pastors from the pastor's desk with all the stuff that's happening and the pastor's thoughts and also prayer emails um, opt in. If you don't, that's absolutely fine. Um, this week, there's quite a few things starting up. House groups are restarting um, this week. So speak to your house group leaders. If you're not in a house group and you'd like an opportunity to grow and to get to know people, speak to myself or Gordon. Um, with the weather this week, a great opportunity to meet in the garden and have a social. Hint, hint, that's what we'll be doing. Um, on Thursday, there's the prayer meeting on Thursday. This Thursday, 8 a.m. in the building. I think it's Gordon that's leading. Um, there will be toast and coffee. I'll do toast. <laughs> Don't look so surprised. Jam and marmalade. Um, one hour, please come along for, for prayer to start this, this, this month off. Um, Thursday as well. The cafe is restarting this week. So if you're involved in cafe, it's 12, 12 till 2, I'm guessing. 12 till 2. And then Sue RTC is at 2 o'clock. Half 2. I nearly got the times right. Half 2 for RTC this Thursday. On Friday, there, we're having a, there should be one of these on some of the chairs. Please take it with you. Um, this Friday, a quiz night. Um, I know some people are quite competitive in the church. I'm trying not to look at anybody. But we're doing it to raise money for James for a, a wheelchair. So please come along and support that. Friday, 7 p.m. An advance notice for next Tuesday, the BBC Bible, Business and Coffee at 7.30. Tonight... Ingo is leading us for our evening praise, 6.30 I'm here, everyone's welcome. And Gordon's going to come and read the epistle of David. We've had a letter from Dave Lyons in Scotland. Epistle of David. And uh, those of you who are visitors, David uh, is a, a young guy from the church who uh, is in a rehab center um, in Scotland at the moment, and God is doing an amazing work in him. Here's his latest letter. Dear church, firstly, I'd like to say that I love and miss you all deeply. God is good. He's constantly working in me through the good and the bad times, and believe me, it's tough here at times. Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That bit of scripture keeps being put on my heart. I had another roller coaster of a week last week. My old roommate was really negative at times, but he got moved out, and now today I'm expecting another one, God willing. I'm just so happy that I have a lovely church who is constantly praying for me and keeping in touch. I'm praying for guidance, strength, and wisdom for my future. 
Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not for man. Psalm 32 verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. I thank the Lord for my life. I should not still be here today, but I am because God has a plan for me and loves me. There are good and bad days here, a lot of bad energy at times, but I guess that comes with communal living. I pray that they get covered with positive energy instead. Next Friday is graduation for some people who have completed the program last year and two of the now staff members also graduate. So we've got to go out next week to get smart shoes, trousers, etc. I need to wear a shirt and tie. And then he's put a little emoji with the faces turned upside down, you know. It does give me hope. As you can imagine, the success rate isn't great. I'm off now because we're starting our next teaching after the break. So God bless and love to you all, David. And as has become David's epistle's custom, he finishes with a prayer. I can ask you to bow your heads and hearts and we receive this prayer and join with David in this prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the work you do in all our lives. Thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. You're a God who never lets us down and never will, so long as our eyes and heart are fixed onto you. I pray for all suffering addicts that you can put someone in their path as you have me. Keep them safe with a meal. Please turn their hearts towards you because it's not impossible. May you keep me safe, focused, and hungry for more of you, Father. And may all who hear this prayer be safe and blessed with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Gordon. Um, one more notice that's a surprise, and it's um, Jenny Walker's birthday today. Happy birthday to Jenny. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> 21. <laughs> um, I work with a guy that kind of knows, and um, he's a, a young guy in his 20s. He watches YouTube prolifically. And um, that's where he gets all his worldview and information from. And he said, I was watching a video on YouTube and I rolled my eyes. I didn't let him see me. Because the previous video he'd watched was, he was trying to convince me that the Garden of Eden was in Miami. And the evidence for that was partly that um, Canaan sounds like Canada. So I was like, that's pretty poor evidence. But he, he played this video for me um, about two weeks ago. And the guy said that they went to, basically he was saying that the Israelites um, conquered places and they took their gods and they, that, 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 that got morphed into the Bible. So I listened to the video briefly and um, apparently they blew the trumpet for three days and the sound effect caused the walls to fall down. And then he said that they, they conquered Jericho and they took their gods. So I said, press pause there for a second. And I said, let me just explain something. They didn't blow the trumpet for three days. That's not in the Bible. Um, but also, just to help you with a little bit of Bible knowledge, they left Egypt. God rescued them out of Egypt. God parted the, the sea. And they went into the desert. And they went to the mountain, Mount Sinai. And I, I said, you've heard this? You've heard this? He said, yes, yes, yes. I said, when they went to Mount Sinai, they met with God. And God descended on the mountain. And it says this in verse 18 of um, Exodus 19, Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. There was thunder, there was lightning. A million people were stood at the foot of this mountain and then God gave them the first commandment and the first commandment was Hugh Williams caught his eyes smiling at me and he was about to say it, is only have one God. So why would they suddenly go and steal other gods? They wouldn't do it because they've met with the living God. And what does it say in, in Exodus? That they saw the, the mountain trembling. The whole camp trembled with fear. And I say that this morning because I know what Gordon's preaching on. He's in Exodus. But I asked the question to myself, should we fear God? 
Do we live in fear of God? And I don't mean scared. Do we live our lives in a reverence, respectful fear of the living God? Psalm 25 says this, The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. It's not lovely. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. And there's a lovely verse in Acts, and it says this, Then the church had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement from the Holy Spirit. With that in mind, as we approach God this morning to worship and to hear from his word, shall we, shall we stand and pray and take a moment to quieten our hearts and to remember whose, whose presence we come into? Let's pray. We come into the presence of a God who, when he came down, the mountains trembled. When he came down, there was lightning, there was thunder. He came down in power, yet when he came down to save our souls, he came down humbly, he came down quietly, and he came down in love with a purpose to set the captives free so that people could come to know him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence. We thank you that it delights you and you invite us to come into your presence. Thank you for your, even though you're all powerful, you're all loving. And this morning we pray that you would come by your spirit. You would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And with the reverence and respect that is due your holy name. Thank you that you are an awesome, amazing God. And thank you that you love us. And we pray, Lord, this morning we give you permission to speak to our hearts. To come and move amongst us. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lisa.
there's a real difference when you stand at the front to when you stand at the back. When you stand at the front, you can hear you all worshipping. Uh, one day we'll be in heaven, all singing, holy, holy, holy. But before then, a few things to get through. Um, I'd like to invite Rob, the MTL, for prayer. There you are, Rob. I didn't see at the beginning, I was thinking, I'm hoping he's here somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everybody. Just want to let you know about um, two things prayer-related happening in the church um, this month. First of all, uh, we're going to be having another prayer walk. Um, that will be taking place on Thursday the 14th of September. And the same time as before, between 6.30 and 7.30. I think we had a really good time on the last prayer walk. Um, personally, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, we wanted to do another one this month whilst we still have the light in the evenings and the weather's still reasonable. So, as before, if you're able to come along from, for the walk, then that's great. If you're able to get to the church but not come for the walk, then Gordon's kindly going to be leading a time of prayer here in the church. And then, if you're not able to come for the walk or to come to the church for prayer, then please can I just encourage you, as before, just to spend time between 6.30 and 7.30 at home, just praying for those out walking through Kimnall Bay and pray for Kimnall Bay as a community. So that's 14th of September between 6.30 and 7.30. So the only other thing I want to let you know about is a, um, a new monthly um, guided prayer um, letter that I've, I've started this month. One of the things that I wanted to do in this role was to um, spend time looking at the Lord's Prayer. And so each month I'll just be producing a, a short thought on the Lord's Prayer and then some prayer topics to pray for um, through each week of the month. And so in September, just briefly, we're looking at how Jesus himself is teaching us in the Lord's Prayer how to pray and how we're able to call God our Father and what a privilege that is for us. And then for each week of September, we've got some prayer topics to, to pray for. And so week one, we're praying for the children as they go back to, to school, college, and young people who go to college and university. Week two, praying for the leaders in the church. Week three, praying for our community in Kimnall Bay. And then week four, praying for, for mission. I'm, more, I'm very aware that most of you will have your own prayer routines. Um, so this is just designed to be maybe something extra that you can pray for through the week. Or if you don't have a prayer routine and it's something you'd like to start getting into the habit of, then why not you just use this as a guide as you pray each day during the week. And so these are available. I've put them on the table over there if you want to just grab one when you, when, on your way out. And they'll be emailed out to you as well. So you've got a copy via email. Cool. So those are the two prayer things. And then I'm just going to pray for the children and as they go out for their learning this morning. Lord, we just thank you for each one of our children and we pray for them as they go out this morning. As they learn about you, we pray that we will that they will learn what they will learn will stay with them, Lord, and it will just be something they'll remember as they grow up, Lord, and that one day they will come to the realization of who you are and what you have done for them. Pray for them as they go out this morning. Just bless them and give them a great time, we pray. Pray the same for the, the young people, Lord, as they stay in this morning, as they hear the message, Lord. May it just be something that sticks with them, again, that they will remember as they grow up and one day that they will come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Please take your seats. I'd like to invite Helen and Bill to come and join me, please. Here at KBC, we celebrate communion once a month on the first Sunday. It's a special service to remember what Christ has done. It's also the service that we bring in new members, which is a, a special thing to bring new members into the church family. And um, Gordon will be doing that um, straight after this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was sat down having a special meal, the Passover meal, with his disciples. It was a special time for the Jews. Once a year, they would celebrate the Passover. It was a holy and a precious time. They were remembering. They were celebrating. They were giving thanks to what God had done. They'd been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. They'd been set free. They'd been delivered. And they were giving thanks to that meal. And at that meal, Jesus said this, I have been eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Before he was going to the cross, Jesus was eager to have this final meal because it was very, very special. Jesus was about to go to the cross and pay the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be set free from our sins, so that we could have freedom and we could know him personally. And Jesus sat at the table and said, this cup, is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. A sacrifice for you. He said that to his disciples, and he says that to us this morning. His sacrifice was for each of us personally. So let's close our eyes, and let's fix our eyes upon him. And let's take a moment to remember And to be thankful that a holy God who's all-powerful came down humbly, quietly, lovingly, and went to the cross willingly and suffered the most awful pain. The new covenant, the new agreement between Almighty God and anyone who will put their trust in him. We do that by faith. And if you've never done that, by faith, with your eyes closed, you can say, Jesus Thank you that you've been to the cross, that I can be forgiven, that my sins can be washed away 
by your blood and because you suffered greatly. Many of us here this morning have already done that. So let's take a moment to reflect and to be thankful that we can continue in his love and continue in that relationship with him because of what he's done. It was done at a great cost, but what a great privilege we have to know him. A great responsibility to live for him, to honor him, and to live our lives to please him. I'm going to invite Helen to give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread, which represents your broken body, the enormous sacrifice that you made for our sin. We cannot begin to imagine what you endured on the cross so that we can be free from our guilt and shame and completely forgiven. We thank you that you're the bread of life and for the gift of eternal life for all those who receive you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Jesus said this, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Let's take the bread and in our hearts, let's give thanks. Jesus said this, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. I'd like to ask Bill to give thanks for the blood. Gracious Lord God, Father, All the things I enjoy, life, health, friends, family, and even the beauty of the sun rising on a new day, have come from your hand. Today I am thankful for the blood of Jesus that gave us the opportunity, through our faith, to be cleansed of our sins and to be justified. His blood washed me pure as snow. He poured out his love through the shedding of his blood for all of us. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Let's hold on to the cup as it comes round, and we'll drink it together. We got there. We got there. Um, We do this until he comes again. But before we do that, I know we're all very British and we don't like to do this, but just have a look around. Turn to the person next to you, maybe behind you. Go on, don't be shy. God calls us. I know we don't like doing it. (laughs) God calls us to be family together, to support each other, to love each other to forgive each other, to encourage each other until he comes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Gordon, thank you. What Darren said there just chimed exactly with what was going through my head. Last month in August, Ali and I had the unique, at least very unusual, uh, pleasure of spending time with all of my brothers and their wives. And normally these kind of things only happen when it's, I don't know, family occasions, weddings, funerals, etc. But we had a week together uh, on the beautiful island of Arran. And it meant that we had time with one another, it meant that we could speak, we could laugh, we could share some of the tough stuff that was going on in each of our lives, and we uh, were very intentional about making time to pray with one another, and it was precious. 
And it came to me at the end of the week with all my brothers and their wives. We managed not to kill each other, which was good. <laughs> but it came to me that uh, we don't know how many more opportunities that we'll have like that. And so it was a really precious time. And as I've sat at the back of church this morning, rather unusually for me, it, it's been lovely just to be, not to do. And I guess just to encourage you that what Darren said, it's nice to be family together, isn't it? And, you know, like most families, there's an element of dysfunction at times in church. And yet when we come together and we gather around the, the bread and the wine, when we gather under the cross, all of the things that could divide us or that we differ on fall away. And we are focusing in on the Lord Jesus. Talking of family, it's a joy to have Gwen with us today. Gwen, we want you to know just how much we're praying for you and for James, of course. And there was a comment made by Darren earlier that, you know, if you're competitive, come along on Friday night. I think that was for you, Gilmans. I think that was, <laughs> I think we were talking to you there. However, you don't need to be competitive to come along on Friday night because although the quiz is vitally important for some, <laughs> and for me, you'll never want to do another Gordon Weir quiz after this Friday, let me tell you that. But the main purpose of Friday night is to raise funds for this lovely young man. We watched his video last week, do you remember? You can still go online and see that. Um, but we want to help James uh, to be able to enjoy a quality of life until Jesus heals him. But we need to raise quite a bit of money for these special wheelchairs. Now, £20,000 was, was put out there about two weeks ago. Where do we stand, Gwen, as of today? I think the last time I looked yesterday, it was something like 16,000 had already been raised. Is it about 18? I think KBC have got this. I think we can push it over the 20,000 line on Friday night if it's not got there by then. But don't worry, we're not stopping at 20, are we? We can raise more and bless James and bless Gwen as well. Today, it is a joy to welcome more new members into the KBC Fellowship. It just seems to be happening with regularity, which is wonderful, isn't it? I do want you to pray, though, that in the next group of new members, God sends us an architect so that we can <laughs> maybe extend out that way uh, with the new members. And on days like this, I'm reminded of Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16 when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so when we become a Christian, we become part of the worldwide church, the family of believers in Jesus Christ. And today we are excited to be continuing to enjoy God's favor as he continues to bring new brothers and sisters into this local expression of his body here on earth. Let me just read uh, three verses from the Bible as we prepare to welcome our new members this morning. In Romans chapter 12, we read that, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And then in 1 Peter 2, it says that you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then back in Romans, this time in Romans 15, where Paul writes, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So I'm going to call out the names of our new members. As I call out your name, could you just stand and stay standing for me, please? And uh, then we're going to formally welcome you as new members here at KBC. Newly married Omar and Tavana Ahmed. Would you stand, please? Wonderful. Ricky Doherty. Also newly married. In fact, new, more newly married. Charlie and Sophie Fletcher. 
Now, next would have been Heather Gilbert, but you might have read Heather was taken unexpectedly and suddenly unwell last night and is in Bangor Hospital undergoing tests. So when Heather is fully recovered, we'll, do, uh, we'll welcome Heather in when she's back. Matt and Don Jones. Tom and Carol Mapp, hiding away in the corner. There you are. Bryn and Carol Whitaker. Amy Whitaker. And Ryan Whitaker. A whole lot of Whitakers, in fact. <laughs> it's a thrill for us all that God has led each of you to join with us as members of this fellowship. Some of you have been worshipping here for a long time, others much more recently. And we're very grateful for God's leading in your lives to this point. And we share with you the joy of your salvation. We're excited at the prospect of the future as together we serve Christ in this church and in this community. And I'm going to now ask you together to publicly declare before God and before your church family your intention to serve him as part of this local church. Now, some of you have had practice in this recently in saying vows together and so on. So it should, should, be, quite, should be quite easy. But for the avoidance of doubt, the answer is, I will, okay? So Omar and Tavana and Ricky and Charlie and Sophie and Matt and Don and Tom and Carol, Bryn, Carol, Amy and Ryan, will you commit yourself to serve God in this place, to worship him alone, to minister to your brothers and sisters, to support the leaders of this church, to pray for the unity of this church, and to reach out to this community in Jesus' name. I will. I'm going to ask the church to respond. If you're a member or come to the church regularly here, could you stand, please? And your response is, we will, if you feel able to say it. Will you commit yourself to these, our brothers and sisters? Will you pray for them, encourage and love them in prayer and practice, and work alongside them for the sake of the gospel? Well, let's pray for our new members, and we'll pray with the laying on of hands. So if you're standing near our friends, simply please lay hands on them where they are as I pray for them and for us. Our Father God, who gives us all good things, we thank you for our brothers and sisters today. We thank you for sending them here to worship alongside us and to serve you in this church. We are grateful for your leading and for their willingness and obedience. Father, we recognize again this morning that this is your church. Father, will you take us, mold us, Fill us with your Holy Spirit and use us for the raising up of the name of Jesus in this place. Father, help us together to serve you with our gifts, to encourage one another along the way, and above all, to demonstrate humility, unity, and love as we serve you. Lord, continue to pour your blessing on Omar and on Tavana as they bring, begin married life together and as they find ways to serve you in this place. Loving Father, build Ricky into the man of God that you've made him to be. Lord, as Charlie and Sophie have both accepted you as Savior in recent days, may they know you as shepherd, guiding them through life. Father, we pray for Heather this morning and pray that you would be with her in the hospital there in Bangor. Lord, bring her back to full health and strength uh, very soon, we pray. Lord Jesus, help Matt and Don in their parenting of Jack to constantly look to you, their Heavenly Father. Lord, continue to make Tom and Carol aware of just how much you love them. Yes. And Father, for Bryn and Carol, Amy and Ryan, on this red letter day for them as a family, give them a spirit of joy as they continue to seek to serve and honor you as individuals and as a family. Father, Bless this, your church, through these, our brothers and sisters in Jesus, and help us all to be a real help to them in the days, months, and years ahead. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Please take your seats. And if you didn't get the chance, you'd be able to welcome all these new members over coffee at the end of the service. You might all have repetitive strain injury by the end of today.
But what a great thrill it is to welcome in so many people as members and to see the KBC family continue to grow. Darren gave you a clue where I'm going today, and it's in the Ten Commandments. Don't hear that preached on very much nowadays, do you? The Ten Commandments. It used to be that they were seen as a bedrock of a healthy, stable society. Not murdering, not stealing, not lying, not being unfaithful, honoring your parents, etc. These used to be viewed as wholesome, positive ways to live. Nowadays, if you hold to God's guidelines for living, well, well, people might say to you, you don't still believe that old tosh, do you? Sadly, but inevitably, the more society has turned away from living by God's holy standards, the worse society has become. Would you agree with that? I'm glad you agree. But this morning, just for the avoidance of doubt, this morning is not about them out there. It's about us in here. Within the church, if we are not careful, we can take on some of the world's characteristics. We can drift away from God's blueprint for our lives. And when we do that, sometimes we make it very hard for our non-Christian friends and neighbors to distinguish any difference between them and us. We, after all, are to be salt and light salt which brings flavor, salt which prevents decay, light which banishes darkness. It's difficult to do that if we resemble the world around us. And that can be seen in how the attitudes within the church in recent decades has changed on a whole number of aspects. Attitudes about the role of women, attitudes on the whole spectrum of LGBT issues, attitudes to the Christian's relationship with alcohol or with drugs, attitudes and behaviors around what we're happy to watch on our TV screens. Often these attitudes and behaviors have swung so far away from what would have been acceptable to a previous generation that they, were they here, would struggle to recognize the church or at least to differentiate between Christian biblical values and that of the world. Now, one of the areas where that's most obvious, where it's most visible to our non-Christian friends is in our language, what comes out of our mouths. And that's what I want to address today. But as I do so, there might be some of you already switching off going, I've got that one sussed. That doesn't apply to me. I can start thinking about what I'm going to have for my dinner. Um, Please, can I just say, please don't put that particular barrier up. Because there are things in each of our lives, myself included, where we need to allow God's Holy Spirit to shine into the darkest recesses of our hearts to expose anything there which is not pleasing and honoring to God. So as I get going this morning, I'm going to pray a prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139. Pray it with me, line by line, if you feel able. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. I want to read just one verse together this morning at the beginning. Exodus chapter 20 verse 7 You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. I wonder how many times you hear God's name in a week. I mean, obviously you hear it for an hour or two on a Sunday when you come to church, but actually I suspect that you'll hear it far more often away from church than at church amongst your neighbors or your colleagues or on the TV or in a film. God's name is everywhere. People are always talking about him. People are always talking about him or his son, Jesus Christ. The problem is that the way that they're talking about him is not the right way. We live in the OMG generation, when the misuse of God's holy name has sunk to a new depth, being abbreviated to a phrase that's so pervasive 
that you'll hear it coming from the lips of toddlers. You'll not be surprised to know that it's perfectly acceptable as a phrase in advertising and in marketing. It is used as shorthand to express surprise or mock disbelief. And you may think saying OMG is, is less harmful than the full version for which it stands, oh my God. After all, they're not actually saying God's name when they say OMG, are they? Yeah, that's true, but I don't buy it. I hear some Christians saying OMG and then defending it by saying that, well, I didn't mean oh my God, I meant oh my gosh or oh my goodness. Firstly, I don't think anyone who's in your ear, earshot, is uh, able to distinguish between the two. Secondly, placing a substitute for an expletive is just to not have the discipline to simply refuse to cheapen our output of language. Maybe we start by considering the facts, and the facts are this, that names matter. At least they used to. In the culture of the Old Testament, we've got many examples of names being given to children because of what they meant or because of the circumstances prevalent at the time. So, for example, Rebecca, when she gave birth to twin boys, one of them was born with lots of hair, and the other one was born gripping the heel of the other twin, So the one with all the hair was called Esau. Remember the verse? And Esau was an hairy man (laughs) in the authorized version. And the one who came out holding on to his brother's heel was called Jacob, meaning he grasps the heel. Now that's a very specific name, isn't it? Is anyone here called he grasps the heel? (laughs) No. Hannah thought that she couldn't have children. Then she prayed. God answered her prayer by giving her Samuel, Samuel, which means God hears or God heard me. Abraham and Sarah were way past the age of having children until God intervened and gave them Isaac. Didn't just happen. That would have been too much of a shock for an old couple like Abraham and Sarah to suddenly wake up one day and hey, presto, they had a baby. No, God told them in advance that it was going to happen. And when God told them, Abraham just about doubled over with laughter probably half amusement, half amazement. And so when their son was born, they called him Isaac, just like God had told them to, because Isaac means he laughs or laughter. We get to the New Testament, names still matter. Simon becomes Peter, Cephas, the rock. Saul's identity is changed as he becomes Paul, a new man in Christ. Now, in our day and age, Maybe we don't pay too much attention to our names as far as their meanings go, but names do still matter to us. And I'll bet when you, if your parents had a baby, you got one of those little baby name books to work out what your name of your, in your child was going to be. Um, there are some names that are good, some that are funny. Gordon means great, spacious hill. <laughs> Not sure how I feel about that. Darren means exile. It's a worry, isn't it? (laughs) Hugh, I looked yours up. You've got three names. How how does that work? Is that because you always do three points? So, (laughs) Hugh means mind, thought, and spirit. Very deep. Is Natalie not here today? You can go home and tell Natalie that her name means Christmas Day. That's a good fun one, isn't it? Tavana, where are you? Tavana means powerful. So Omar, be afraid, all right? <laughs> but Elisha wins, all right? Elisha wins. Elisha means blissful. Aww. Isn't that nice? How do you feel when someone gets your name wrong? You know what I mean? You're introduced to someone, and then half a minute later, they've changed your name. You ever experienced that? When I used to play competitive golf, inevitably it would mean playing with people that I'd never met before. You turn up on the first tee, you're introduced, you shake hands, you take their card and you swap it and you see their name and you say, hi, good morning, my name's Gordon. And that's fine. Somehow, more often than not, by the ninth tee or there around, on the halfway part of the round, my name had changed to Gary or George (laughs) or Grant. Now, They had my name on their scorecard in their hand. They still couldn't get it right. 
only served to stiffen my resolve to beat them. <laughs> because when someone gets your name wrong, it comes across as rude, doesn't it? It says, in effect, your name doesn't matter to me. Which means, in effect, you don't matter to me. But names do matter. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. There it's talking about your reputation, isn't it? So we, we might say in our day and age, we might say something like, so-and-so, oh yeah, they've got a very good name in the community. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Now, names matter. And crucially for us this morning, I want to point to the fact that God's name matters. And when it comes to God's name, it should matter more than any other name. We're tremendously privileged to know the name of God, and therefore how we handle it should be very important to us. Let me read to you just another verse or two from Exodus chapter 3, when God interrupts Moses from his shepherding duties and calls him to remove his footwear because he's on holy ground. Do you remember? And God introduces himself and says this, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. What's happening here? Well, God has got a job for Moses. He's to go to the Egyptian Pharaoh, and he's to have him free the Israelites. Moses is fearful. He's full of excuses why he's not the man for the job. He says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Then God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am has sent me to you. Now this name, which appears as YHWH, the most widely accepted pronunciation being Yahweh, It's a hugely significant name. It's translated in most English Bibles as the Lord, capital letters. You'll often see it in your Bible. In fact, it appears some 6,800 times in the Old Testament. Every time you see it, you need to remember that it refers back to this moment of encounter at the burning bush with Moses and this great promise of revelation of who God is. I am who I am. Now, that's a very enigmatic statement, isn't it? On, on first reading, it's hard to understand. Yet within it is a very deep, a very profound statement about the character of God. And it's perhaps at its most fundamental a statement about the very existence of God. It's been translated as, I am the living one. I am the one who exists. I am the one who will be who I will be. It's a description unlike any other that you will ever come across. This is representative of the holiness or the otherness of Almighty God. He exists independently of anyone or anything else. And your very first four words that you read in your Bible tell us this, don't they? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God was there before anything. Before anything was, I am was there. It takes a lot of thinking about, doesn't it? For God to reveal who he is to mere mankind says a great deal to us this morning about his generous nature, his desire to share his goodness with us. And in the Old Testament, we begin to see many more of his attributes. And when we learn more about his attributes, we learn more of his names. In fact, the Bible has over 300 names for God. And that's because it's impossible to capture the full character of God in any one attempt or in any one name. So we read of Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sidon, the Lord our righteousness 
El Shaddai, the Lord is sufficient. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah, don't worry, I'm not doing all 300. Jehovah Nissai, the Lord our victory. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Elam, the most high God, and many, many more besides. Give yourself a challenge. Go and find out how many of those 300 you can find, and you will not be disappointed as you discover more about God's names and his character. Names matter. God's name matters more than any other. Therefore, God's name is to be respected. In the Old Testament, the people knew what a treasure they had in knowing the name of God. They valued it so highly that they refused to even use it when they spoke or even when they prayed. And that's why we have those letters, Y-H-W-H, because they only used the consonants when they wrote it out, just in case they, they became guilty of sinning by using the name. On the special occasions that they wrote out God's I am name in full, here's what they had to do. They had to make sure that they were ceremonially cleansed. Then they would put on new clothes. They would use a new quill. They would write out the name and then they would throw the quill away and they would destroy the clothes. And even when they had written it down in full, they would not dare speak it. And so whenever the name appeared, they would substitute the word Adonai, which means simply my Lord or Lord. And that's why you have that word Lord in your Bibles as many as 6,800 times. The Lord's name is special and it's to be treated as such. So how come we don't hold to that that same strict code of behavior as the Old Testament people of God? Well, when Jesus appeared, he came to not just reveal God's name to us, but to show us God himself. The name Jesus itself means the Lord saves. And of course, another of the names that we associate with Jesus, maybe particularly around Christmas time, is the name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And in Jesus, God is inviting us in closer than we were ever able to go before, not just to know about him, but to know him. And so it was that Jesus would teach his disciples to approach God as their heavenly father, our father who art in heaven. And in the New Testament, we are taught to address God as Abba, which simply means father. Actually, it's more intimate than that. It's an Aramaic word which can be more likened to the word that we as children might use for daddy, Abba. There's that special intimacy, that term of endearment that young children use to address their fathers, signifying the close relationship between a father and their child, as well as that childlike trust that a young child puts in their daddy. It's another name of God, and it's another name which is to be respected and valued. And yet, and yet we know, don't we, that all too often this is not the case. God's name, instead of being respected, is abused. Many of you know uh, or will have heard speak or will have read some of his books, the former pastor of Westminster Chapel, R.T. Kendall. And in his book on the commandments, he pointed out that in the uh, concise Oxford Dictionary, the entry under the word Jesus is as follows, as you see on the screen. Jesus, a colloquial interjection, an exclamation of surprise and dismay. And then in brackets, name of founder of Christian religion died circa AD 30. I find that really shocking. That the first definition is the use of the name of Jesus as a curse or as an expletive rather than who he is as a person. Yet if we, you and I, were to audit the times that we hear the name of Jesus spoken, I suggest that we would have to concede that if it were by frequency alone, then the dictionary has it the right way around. Because people hear, people use Jesus' name all the time, don't they? 
they use Jesus' name when they hear bad news or when they drop a pound coin down the drain or when they see a horrific act unfold on their TV screen, when their favorite footballer misplaces a pass, when someone tells them something that they struggle to believe. They use Jesus' name when they're being angry, when they're being sad, when they're dismayed, confused, tired. They use Jesus' name, they think humorously, seriously, often frivolously. And Jesus' name is abused and misused in all situations. Seems to me, tell me if I'm wrong, seems to me that this is unique to the Christian faith. I've never heard someone hit their thumb with a hammer and yelp, oh Buddha. It just doesn't happen. Jesus' name is singled out because the devil's behind this. Our TV programs, our films are full of it. Now, you'll know as well as I do that the TV companies have been pushing the boundaries on this for years. Even though they're all signed up to a so-called watershed at 9 p.m., before which they're limited in what they can broadcast in terms of language or graphic sexual or graphic violent content, the name of Jesus is routinely allowed to be abused way before that, which does what? It normalizes that mistreatment of the name of God to a younger audience, and it removes any sense of its specialness. I don't know what happened there. What happened? Something fell over. That was dramatic, wasn't it? When we hear it being misused and abused in that way, it should jar with us. And yet I suspect that we are seriously desensitized to it by its ubiquitous use. Stop for a minute and ask yourselves, consider how our Muslim neighbors would react if the name of Muhammad was routinely ridiculed or cheapened in this way. When Jesus' name is abused, either in your earshot or across the airwaves, how do you feel? Do you care? Do you even notice? I wonder if you're a have the same experience as I do sometimes. You're in someone's company and they use Jesus' name or the name of God in a way that's anything but holy. And instantly they remember that you're a Christian. And so they respectfully say, oh, sorry about that. And then they continue speaking and without hardly missing a beat, they do the same repeatedly. And I've come to the conclusion that it's it's so habitual, it's so endemic, they don't even know that they're doing it. Just imagine for a moment that that was your husband or wife's name or your child's name. The name of someone that you love dearly routinely being used as a swear word or an expletive or a curse. That would hurt us, wouldn't it? And so the routine, unthinking abuse of the name of the Son of God who came to show us love should affect us to our core. Not so we become pious, holy Joes who come over all holier than thou, but no, that we react in a way that's gracious to the person, but ultimately and primarily loving to our God. Let me switch tacks for a moment. We too can abuse God's name and not treat it with the reverence it deserves. We can do that in different ways. Here's one. We can do it by invoking God's name into our conversations without his permission. What do I mean by that? Well, you may be like me, come across people who use God's name as a bit of a stick to beat people up with. You know, God has told me that you really need to, or God has spoken to me and told me that you were wrong when you, when in actual fact, God has done nothing of the sort. And that person is abusing God's name to further their agenda. Now that, to me, is a flagrant breach of this command telling us not to misuse the name of the Lord. We can also do it by taking glory to ourselves that should have been rightly His. Someone says to you, what a wonderful job you did. You're so talented. The way that you did that really spoke to me. What you said really blessed me. And that's wonderful when people encourage one another, isn't it? But when the person receiving that positive encouragement, that feedback, you know, it comes from a good place. But the danger is that when you receive it, you take it to yourself instead of deflecting the praise 
and the worship back to where it's come from, that rightful place, giving the glory and honor to God, the one who blesses us. Why? To be a blessing. And that praise, that accolade belongs only to the name of our Lord. We also fail to treat the name of the Lord with due reverence in other ways. For example, when we're praying, we say the words without meaning them. Out of habit, we begin our prayers with our Father. We end our prayers within Jesus' name. Amen. But if we're doing it ritualistically, in an unthinking manner, we're minimizing, we're negating any sense of reverence with which we're to come and approach God. Similarly, we some, and I'm speaking to myself here. Please don't feel that I'm beating you all up here. It's for me, this sermon. Similarly, we sometimes use his name as a marker or as a stopgap in our prayers, like a non-word, like er or um. It's far better, Gordon, to be silent in those moments, I think. And how about minimizing God by using inappropriate language to describe him? He's not the big guy. He's not the man upstairs. He's almighty God. And we're to show him respect. And brothers and sisters, let's not join in with the OMG thing. It's really not helpful. And we should also, of course, be watching our tongues in other ways. And I don't have time to develop this this morning. But it's not a great advert for the church if we out there are routinely throwing language around like our non-Christian friends do. Hugh reminded us recently, and I had read this story some years ago, and it's, it's a fascinating story, that one of the astonishing happenings of the Welsh revival just over 100 years ago was how the pit ponies no longer recognized their master's voices because those converted men had cut out all of their swearing. So much so that the ponies did not recognize them. That's a testimony. That's a testimony to be admired and copied, isn't it? Just notice there's a follow-up to this commandment as given to the people by God through Moses at Sinai. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Peterson translates this verse, no using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter. God won't put up with the irreverent use of his name. Now, that's not good news for the person who chooses to ignore this commandment. And there are certainly extreme examples in the Old Testament of, of, those, of how those who blasphemed the name of God were dealt with. Let me finish with a positive, that we are to use God's name well. Instead of using God's name in a derogatory fashion, we of all people should be at the forefront of using his name well and in its appropriate context as the revealed name of the most loving force in the universe. In the Lord's Prayer, we come across these lovely words, hallowed be thy name. And knowing God personally leads directly to us appreciating his character. And so when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we're acknowledging that God is above all in heaven and on earth. There's no one else to compare with him. He is holy. He is supreme. He reigns above all. His name is to take first place. He is number one. And so we come praying to our Father, hallowed be thy name. We come reverently as part of our worship. According to Martin Lloyd-Jones, the word hallowed means to sanctify, to revere, to make holy, to keep holy. It is to have reverence. It is to have respect. It is to set apart as special. And we pray those words, don't we? Hallowed be thy name. But we might also consider this morning that we are hallowed by the name. We are made holy by the name of Jesus. Not by anything we do or any merit of our character. The Bible makes it clear that we're all sinners, that no one is worthy, no one that is except Jesus himself. There is salvation, it says in Acts 4, in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Philippians 2, Paul reminds us that God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory 
of God the Father. No wonder we're to pray, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. We've sung it today, haven't we? For those of you whose alarms are going off, let me just encourage you that I'm drawing this to a close. As we finish today, may we all have the same attitude, the same love of that name as the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth. When he was seriously ill, when he was close to death, and there were some legal matters that had to be dealt with, the lawyer came and met with him and his wife, Catherine, and the lawyer said to his wife, Mrs. Booth, if you can get him to sign these papers, when the time comes, the will can be executed much more smoothly. But the problem was that William Booth was drifting in and out of consciousness. He was often delirious. But they were able to get him awake long enough to get the signature, or at least to try. Miraculously, he was able to grasp the pen as Catherine put it in his shaking hands, and he began signing, although it wasn't his usual fluid signature. The lawyer said it was good enough. Shortly afterwards, he died. Later examination revealed that on every one of those papers, the signature was different than his known inscription. In fact, it was not his name at all. On every line, he had simply written the name Jesus. The only name on his mind in his dying moments was his Lord. I don't know whether this subject affects you. I hope it doesn't. I hope that you're able to keep what comes out of your mouth pure whether or not it affects you personally. I I, I hope that it affects you in the way that you respond when you hear Jesus' name being mistreated, when you hear the name of God being invoked in a way which is not honoring to him. As I say, not to stand there pointing the finger, but to respond with grace, but to stand up for your Lord. To stand up for what you know. If it's helpful, remember that little idea that if that was your loved one whose name was being abused, you'd be quick, I suspect, a lot quicker than we are when it's Jesus' name. That shouldn't be the case. I trust this week that you keep his name holy, that you keep his name precious, and that you treat it with the love and the respect that it so richly deserves. Amen. Amen. Can I encourage the band to come back up and join me? And uh, we're going to sing in closing together, and then I'll pray. If you are visiting with us, please, uh, as I said earlier, there's going to be refreshments available. And it's such a nice day, you might want to spill out outside and enjoy some fellowship in the, the open air. We don't know how much more sunshine we're going to get this year, so enjoy it while we have it. May the Lord bless you. Come back uh, tonight to hear Ingo. Don't forget Friday and the the quiz night for James. Come ready to donate generously, please, to that. And on Thursday morning, if you're able to join us for prayer, I would love that. Again, just to reiterate something Dan said earlier, the house groups are starting this week, and a number of you are not yet in a house group. If you'd like to be, come and see us today, and we'll make sure that happens. Can I invite you to stand as Lisa leads us in our final song? Oh
Clearly, our sister Linda's having a bit of a problem there. We want to give her all the space that she needs, and there's people going to be helping her there. But let me pray, and I encourage you to go and get your tea and coffee and let the folks that are helping Linda uh, give them the space that they need. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we offer you our mouths as instruments of your grace and your peace. Lord, help us to use your holy name only in a loving way, never to express anger or frustration. Forgive us, we ask, when we get this wrong. Lord, we never want to be guilty of using your name trivially, nor of using it for our prejudices. But we do thank you this morning for the strong, the mighty, saving name of Jesus. May you always find us trusting in his holy name and using his name reverently and lovingly in prayer and praise. Lord, we pray for Linda right now and pray that you would help her, uh, whatever's going on, Lord, and just uh, with those who are helping her too. Bless our time together now, we pray. Be in our conversations in Jesus' name. Amen.